we're going to start by looking at the features that all living organisms have in common and lots of people call that Mrs. Now, I call Mrs. Gren. So remember, if they say, give some features that all living organisms share, you're going to say movement, respiration, sensitivity, you're going to say nutrition, excretion, uh, reproduction and growth. And that just means getting bigger. So if it's non-living like a virus, you can easily say it does not move, it does not respire, it does not excrete. So just list any of the Mrs. Nug factors and you will get the marks. Now we're going to look at the plant and animal cell, very basic biology here. First of all, let's start by the, listing the organelles that both animal and plant cells share. So remember, they both have cell membranes, cytoplasm, nuclei or nucleus. They have ribosomes, mitochondria. Now, in terms of the plant cell, there's a few extra organelles you need to list. That's the cell wall, the vacuole, and also chloroplasts. We now need to look at the role of each of those organelles in turns. So because it's so key that you get these really basic questions right in your exam, because if they say, what does the nucleus do, you need to be able to write that. So what does the nucleus do? It controls the activities of the cell. What does the cytoplasm do? It's where chemical reactions take place. What is the role of the cell membrane? It controls what enters and leaves the cell. What is the role of ribosomes? And that this is new for this specification. It's where protein synthesis takes place, i.e. it's where proteins are made. Looking more closely at the plant cell now, what is the role of the cell wall? First of all, state that the cell wall is made out of cellulose and that it protects and supports the cell. The vacuole, remember that's filled with cell sap, which also helps to maintain the structure of the cell. Lastly, chloroplasts, remember they're full of a green pigment called chlorophyll, it gives leaves the green colour, and that's where photosynthesis takes place. A couple of tricky words you may have come across is eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Don't worry, it's just a very posh way of describing the type of cell we're talking about. Eukaryotes are all animal cells as we know it, and that's because they contain membrane-bound organelles such as nuclei, mitochondria, etc. So an animal cell, like I said, is an example of a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotes, we're talking about viruses and bacteria here because they contain no membrane-bound organelles. So they contain no nuclei, which we know because they contain strands of DNA or RNA instead. So we now need to take lots of different types of cell in turn and know quite a lot of information about them. So I'm going to start with the bacterial cell. We can see from the diag diagram that a bacterial cell has a cell wall Sometimes it has a slime capsule around the edge. Sometimes it has a flagella, which is a tail that helps the bacteria to move. As I've already said, it doesn't have a distinct nucleus. Instead, it has a circular chromosome, which we call a nucleoid. It has other small rings of genetic material. We call these plasmids. And that, remember, is important when we talk about genetic engineering. Then you find more typical things such as cytoplasm and cell membranes. In terms of things like whether they're pathogenic or non-pathogenic, remember that they can be both. So a pathogen is a microorganism that causes disease. It makes sense, therefore, that some bacteria are pathogenic. Such examples include pneumococcus, which is responsible for pneumonia, tuberculosis, remember that gives people TB where they cough up blood, very horrible disease. However, some bacteria are very useful, like those used in yogurt making. The example here is lactobacillus, Bulgaricus. You remember lastly that bacteria are unicellular, which means that they're made of one cell only. Looking at viruses now, because that leads on quite nicely from bacteria, these are very, very small things. They're much smaller than bacteria. They're far more simple because they're simply made out of a protein coat which surrounds either DNA or RNA. They don't have any of the typical organelles you would find in other types of cell. Crucial thing here, as I've already said, is that they're non-living, they do not excrete, they do not respire, they do not grow. They're always pathogenic, there's no such thing as a good virus, they're always out to hurt you. And examples here include the flu virus, the cold virus, HIV, which is very famous because it causes AIDS. A new virus you need to know about is tobacco mosaic virus, which causes discoloration in plant leaves, and that's due to the fact it prevents chloroplast formation. Next up, we're looking at the protoctists. This is known as the dustbin kingdom. Lots of various organisms which don't fit into the other categories fit into protoctists. Some of them have animal cell properties, some of them have plant cell properties. Starting with algae and also corella. 
These both have chloroplasts, which means they're more plant-like. Things like amoeba are more animal-like. You'll see that they don't have chloroplasts, they don't have a cell wall as such. And they all use diffusion in order to obtain their nutrients and get their oxygen. One key one you need to know about is plasmodium. This is pathogenic because it causes the disease malaria. And the plasmodium is the small protoctus that lives in the female mosquito's bodies and that's what she injects when she bites you. So that's actually what gives you malaria. Do note that they can either be unicellular or multicellular, so made up of one cell or many cells. Fungi now. Now fungi, they're quite easy because you can draw literally a plant cell but just make it slightly more circular. So it has the same organelles you would find in a plant cell apart from the fact it obviously doesn't have chloroplasts, but it does have a cell wall. This is made out of chitin, you do need to know that. It has a cell membrane, cytoplasm, it has a vacuole. Now there are lots of different examples of fungi including mucor and mushrooms. One thing you do need to just be able to mention, this is a case where you just shove in some keywords and it doesn't even matter if they don't even make sense, I'll give you a mark as long as you mention it. They have things called hyphae, which are thread-like structures which form a network called mycelium. Do notice that fungi carry out saprotrophic nutrition, and that means that they extracellularly secrete enzymes onto dead matter, which it breaks down and then absorbs as its food. Crucial words here are extracellularly secreting enzymes, which break down dead matter, and that's how they actually obtain their food. There are some useful examples of fungi, including yeast, now remember that's used in beer and bread making. Why? Because when yeast undergoes anaerobic respiration, that means respiration without oxygen, it breaks down glucose into ethanol, which is clearly used in beer making, and also carbon dioxide. And it's those bubbles of carbon dioxide that actually help that bread to rise. If we're going to use the correct nomenclature when we're talking about naming things, we can talk about the five kingdoms, and that consists of plants, animals, protoctus, bacteria, and fungi. One small thing to notice, which can always catch you out, is how carbohydrates are stored. So in animals it's stored as glycogen, in plants it tends to be stored as starch, things like potatoes are very starch heavy, and then in fungi it's stored as glycogen also.